Well, good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, whenever you've decided to watch this year's State of the University address. I'm Harvey Stanger, president of Binghamton University, and I want to thank you for watching this State of the University address done in a nearly empty Osterhot theater. We've done this several years now, and we always get a pretty good turnout for these events, but because of the conditions, we have to be socially distanced, and I am up here without a mask on, so I have to be in almost an empty auditorium to do this. This picture reminds me, in this first cover slide, that normally we would be giving this address in November or October, in the fall. And this wonderful picture, taken from a drone, navigated by one of our talented photographers, Casey Staff, is a reminder that we didn't do that. In fact, now we are doing it in January on a cold day when the campus is covered in snow. We really couldn't find the right time or the right way to say messages that were complete enough to do this in the fall. We really needed to wait until the end of the fall semester to give this presentation. So let me begin by saying that the first slide second word was probably one of the hardest words we had to choose for this presentation. We had to pick a word that said what we experienced in the year 2020. Challenging was the best we could do, perhaps. But then the next word was even harder. Did you meet the challenge? Did you rise to the challenge? We chose successful that it was a successful year. 2020 was a successful year, even though in many people's minds it will go down as a year that nobody really had much feeling of success. But the analogy that I use is the hurricane analogy. If you ever lived in the line of a hurricane, which I haven't, but I can imagine it's probably pretty scary. You know it's coming a few days ahead of time, maybe a week ahead of time. You don't exactly know where it's going to hit. You don't know how high the winds are going to be. But you know you have to get ready for it. Batten down the hatches. Cover all the windows. Evacuate. Move to the basement if necessary. You don't have a lot of time, but you do everything you possibly can to prepare. And then it comes, and it's probably worse than you had anticipated. It stays for a while, and then it goes away. And the success of weathering a hurricane is measured by your house didn't fall down. Well, I believe if we look at what happened this semester, past semester at Binghamton, we were more than successful. House didn't fall down, and we did a great job of continuing the quality and the excellence that people know is Binghamton University. It was an all-campus response. Everybody had to be involved with this. Hundreds of people in the planning, thousands of people in execution, and if it wasn't an all-campus response, we knew it would not be successful. And when we look back and we look at the achievements that we've made of educating students, continuing our research, making sure that our reputation and rankings continue to draw outstanding students, we can say that it was a success. And we even added features to that success. We became more known, I believe, in leading issues around health care, social justice, and sustainability. Our, our scholarship, our university researchers, is pathbreaking and powerful. And I think that they took the opportunity during the COVID to even up their game, to increase their activity, to work even harder and smarter, to provide more information around the pandemic and to help us recover. And we were lucky. We've had a plan in place for many years, the roadmap, which we found was helpful in us providing the guidance that we needed to get through the pandemic, as well as taking the time to expand its scope as we move forward into 2021. What were the challenges? Well, you can bucket them into five probably separate categories, even though they merged together. Educational. We had to find new ways to educate people. We had to first be educated ourselves in how to educate students in a new way, almost completely remote at many times. 
We had to find a new way to do our research and our scholarship without the access that we normally would have to laboratories, to libraries, to travel. We had to find a new way for our students to live on campus, and they did live on campus. Our residence halls were 80% full, but we had to find a new way to live on campus. The infrastructure, how we made the university become a socially distanced environment that was comfortable and welcoming. And that took a lot of effort and planning. And the one that we probably ignored a lot of times because we had too many things to worry about was the emotional challenge that we had. I mean, everybody had emotions that they probably hadn't felt in a long time at that level. The sadness, the anger, disappointment, confusion. It was a sense of emotion. But at the same time, I think a lot of people felt an emotion of togetherness. As people have said, we're in this together. I, maybe that's a little cliche, but when people got together to make their plans of how we were going to pull this semester off, there were some certain positive emotions in that achievement. The transition. In March, the governor said, go fully remote. And we did, almost immediately. Students pretty much packed up and went home. Faculty had to quickly learn how to use all the technologies that they had probably never thought they might ever learn how to use. They did a great job. And our students did a great job, too. But we also knew that our students, when they got home, they may not have the support that they would have on campus. They wouldn't be living in a residence hall. They wouldn't be having food served three, four times a day in the dining hall. So we knew that we would have to be reaching out to them. We formed a mentor network where faculty and staff reached out to students at home and talked to them and gave them some advice and asked them if they needed anything. We provided assistance to over 840 students, specifically around giving them advice on to how to manage a distance learning class. And if they had technology needs, getting them the right technology, whether it was a new laptop with a camera or a hotspot, so that they could access high-speed wire, wireless internet. Our Binghamton Foundation raised over $200,000 that we distributed to students that were in economic need. I really am extraordinarily impressed and amazed at the work that our essential employees did. The cleaners that came every day, clean the residence halls, clean the bathrooms, clean the hallways, clean the lounges, cleaned every knob on every door. The cooks, that cooked with masks on and served our students in socially distanced ways came every day. The health care support that we provided through the Decker Health Services as well as the mental health support through our counseling center. These were critical people coming during critical times to help our students be successful. We changed the academic calendar, canceled our spring break. We changed how we graded because we allowed students to take pass-fail grades even at the end of the semester after they knew their letter grade. And we modified the tenure process to give faculty at least one more year towards their tenure process. We knew that along the way we had to be flexible because as you make decisions in a time of uncertainty, you know that those decisions sometimes won't be right. And so you have to be willing to admit that they aren't right and be flexible enough to change them. You have to communicate often and accurately, and I think we did that. We probably could have done a better job at all these things, and we probably will in the spring. You have to be diligent. You can't give up. You tend to work a lot. You tend to think about this a lot. And you have to be resilient, meaning you have to bounce back if something bad happens. And I believe we took all four of those attributes and modeled them perfectly across the campus. These five people were critical to the restarting. The public health advisory group, Joanne Fierra Conti, Yvonne Johnston, Richard Moose, Dr. Moose, Mario Ortiz, and Hiroki Sayama. This group of people answered tough questions. All experts in public health they answered tough questions when we had questions about can we do this or should we do this or is this going to be acceptable when there was no guidance whether from the CDC or from the Department of Health in the county or from the New York State Department of Health. When there wasn't guidance 
this group help us find the guidance. We also knew that we had a lot of work to do over the summer, so in May we formed 15 subcommittees, more than 200 people on these subcommittees, redesigning the campus, redesigning how we did things so that we could be ready in the fall to provide an experience for students that wasn't the same as it was fall of 2019, but was as good and as engaging as possible so that students would feel that they made a good decision to come back to Binghamton. That was critical. We wanted students to come back. We knew that if they came back and they studied with their friends in their residence halls, in the libraries, that they would be more successful, that they would get better grades, that they would learn more. We knew that, and we had to find a way to encourage them to come back, and we did a great job. 80% of our students came back to live in the residence hall when national averages show less than 50% of residence halls were filled in the fall. Mid-June, we decided to start opening our laboratories and our workspaces, studios, creative spaces, in order for our faculty to continue to, and to restart their research, their scholarship, and creative activities. It was highly successful. Getting something like that started made a model for the rest of us when we would be starting to return to the campus in August. The faculty over the summer, with the help of the Center for Learning and Teaching, learned all new methods of delivering their standard courses that they had taught for many years in a certain way that was comfortable to them. We created BingFlex, which still will be improved and will continue to get better so that students could be online, watching the class, or in the class at the same time. And we had great cooperation, constant cooperation from the Student Association leadership. And I want to thank them for their support during the summer and during the fall semester. We knew that the highest priority had to be student success. And certainly, you're not going to be successful if you're not going to be healthy and you're not going to be safe. I found how many people really knew how to do this that I probably didn't expect. But people came in, coming out of residential life, our facilities staff, the student association, our recreation department, campus dining staff, did an amazing job of creating an environment that made students feel welcome and made students feel comfortable and at home when they returned to the campus in the fall. We also knew that parents and students would feel much more comfortable if they knew that when they walked into the residence hall that they were in an environment with their friends, many of them new friends, that were all tested negative almost at that exact time. So we created a testing system that when we started to think about it in May and June, we didn't even know if it was possible. We didn't even know if the technology would be available. But we knew that if we could test every student before they moved into the residence hall, find out if they were positive or negative, ask the positives to isolate, ask the negatives to move in, that we would create a sense of safety and a sense of calmness to the parents and to the students. And we did that. We had 99.55% negative tests. Only about 28 students tested positive, and those students, many who went home to do their isolation, came right back, moved into the residence hall, and completed the semester. We tested over 6,000 students during move-in. But then, when the semester started, we knew we had to test more. The campus houses a New York State testing facility up on Bun Hill Road, but that's not where our students get tested. Our students go to the old Union Hall. And we can test up to 1,200 students a day. And during the semester, we tested more than 30,000 students, faculty, and staff in that facility. We could also test students who are symptomatic at the Decker Health Services, which helped us identify possible areas on campus or off campus where the virus might be located. A measure of success. And along the way, we can find some measures of success that when our students left in November to go home for Thanksgiving break, and we tested almost every student as they left, our positivity rate of those students of that cohort during the last two weeks was 1.6%. 
relatively low compared to what we have today in the area, but even then the region's average was 3.9 percent. So I give you the another, another analogy of we were an island of low infection in a sea of an infection rate more than twice the rate on campus. A good reason for celebrating our students for making good choices when they were off campus. But we did have a couple of pauses along the way. October 10th to the 24th, and then again November 18th to the 24th, we had close to 100 positive tests in a two-week period. That was the marker that the governor had set for us to go on fully remote, and we did that once. And after we had done it once in October, the feeling was, how will we ever return back in person? But with strong changes in how our students interacted with each other and with the community, and with a very vigorous testing program, we were able to lower our testing positivity in the last two weeks of October to less than 1%. And the chancellor, with guidance from New York State Department of Health, allowed us to go back in person. We went back in person for about three, three and a half weeks when another spike hit us. And unfortunately, we had to pause and go fully remote for those few days, a couple of days, right before Thanksgiving. A lot of things happen other than just managing COVID during the semester. As people know, we are actively building a campus in Johnson City, a health sciences campus that houses our School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences, but also will be home to our Decker College of Nursing and Health Sciences. And that building at 48 Corliss is almost complete. The first four floors are complete, and in January and February this year, our nursing faculty and staff are moving in to those first four, four floors. We've hired three new directors, Jane Bear Lehman, Rodney Gable, and Michael Buck, to direct our programs and therapies, occupational therapy, physical therapy, and speech and language pathology. They've been hired and they are beginning programs. Occupational therapy will start its first cohort of students in 2025, physical therapy in 2024, and speech language pathology in 2021, this coming fall. The School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences enrolled their fourth cohort. The Doctor of Pharmacy program is a four-year program. That means that this is their fourth and full cohort and that their first graduating class will be this coming May. At 80 Corliss, in between the nursing building and the pharmacy building, the designs for an R&D facility are almost complete, and that completion date for construction is projected to be December of 2022. At the corner of Jenison Street and Corliss Avenue, we have a design for a Ford Family Clinic to help people in that neighborhood, especially those who are elderly, to get clinical support from our nursing students and faculty, as well as a partnership with Lord's Hospital. Our foundation purchased the Gannett Building at 10 Gannett Drive, the old Press and Sun printing press building, in order for us to use it for storage for long term and save on some of the other storage spaces that we're renting right now in the community. The foundation also saw that it was necessary in order to make Johnson City walkable and safe and have a strong campus appearance that purchasing some of the abandoned properties was necessary and they've completed that process. And on the Vestal campus, again, one of the things you can do during a pandemic is we found out you can build things. In fact, it's probably a little bit easier to build things when there's not as many people around. So we went full speed ahead on renovation projects that were approved by the State University Construction Fund, funded by the State of New York on the Vestal campus. Science 2's renovation will be done in March 2022. Science 4, December of 2021. Oneida renovation starts in September. Hinman Dining Hall will be done this August. Cleveland Hall, one of our residence halls in Hinman, 
will be completed in 2021. The engineering building finished its phases four and five. And our baseball clubhouse will be completed next January. The Bartle Library, third floor renovation, on track to be completed January 2024. And we formed a committee, a steering committee, to do a master plan for our fine arts building. In total, across the Vestal campus and the Johnson City campus, we have over $245 million of projects under construction. Well, I'm about halfway through. I want to take some time right now to thank everyone for making this a successful year. Faculty and staff have made a remarkable effort to make our students successful. They have learned new technologies. They have been flexible in their teaching and their working. And they have been providing support for students in ways that we didn't think was possible. So thank you, faculty and staff, for your great support. I also am happy that our fall admission targets were met. We probably were apprehensive that we would meet these targets because we really didn't know whether students were interested in going to college last year. But they did. We welcomed 2,863 new first-year students and 1,241 new transfer students. Our current enrollment is 18,148 students, up 24 students from the fall of 2019. So we did a great job in making sure that our enrollment and our admissions program was at the top of this game. We also completed our 10-year Middle States reaccreditation. The reviewers praised us virtually, saying that we had done a great job in our COVID response. They praised our roadmap strategic plan, and they also praised us because of our student academic high impact learning experiences. And then a final metric to tell you that we did not just think we did a good job, but we actually did a good job transitioning last spring to fully online. Our retention, first year retention, students who lived through that crazy spring of 2020 returned at a record number of 92% up from 90% the year before. I think that's probably one of the best measures of being successful is that you were a place that students wanted to return even more than when we didn't have a pandemic. So you take a pause over the winter break and then you realize 2021 is not going to be any easier. In fact, it's probably going to be a little bit harder. We have some fiscal challenges that we have to address. We know that last year the state did not fund us as they normally would have and held back $6 million of our last year's budget that we probably will never see. We have been told, even though it's not beneficial, but we've been told that we will have a 25% cut this year. That's $11 million of state funds. The shift in enrollment International students couldn't come to campus this year. More undergraduates than graduate students as well has reduced our tuition revenue. It has not been inexpensive to prepare for COVID, to keep up with COVID, not just from cleaning, but also from testing. Our reduced student housing occupancy, 80% is not 100%, has lost us some revenues as well. And we had to refund students last spring when they went home. And we're in a hiring pause because we know without these revenues, we won't be able to hire folks that we would like to replace if people have left. The admissions enrollment mix has shifted. But on the good side, our undergraduate applications right now are the same as last year. And that's not true at a lot of universities and colleges. The, the challenges of recruiting international students are going to be the same. But we do hope that visas will be more available for the fall of 2021 than they were for the fall of 2020. Reputation and rankings are always something that we look at, and we know that our new students that are looking at us are looking at our rankings. An outstanding ranking change by the School of Management this year moved its undergraduate program 
from the 47th ranked undergraduate program in the nation to the 28th ranked undergraduate management program in the nation. Congratulations, School of Management. Congratulations, Upender, and all of your faculty. That is amazing. That kind of a leap in one year is almost impossible, but we know you deserve it. And you're jumping over schools that a lot of people think have a lot more name recognition than Binghamton University. And perhaps that's not true anymore. But we do have some offsets to these financial concerns. We've restructured our housing debt, which has saved us a significant amount of money because of lower interest rates. We've also received federal stimulus support, and we expect to receive more stimulus support from the federal government. The Binghamton Foundation has stepped up and helped us in, with multiple gifts to support changes that we've had to imp implement. We've been using a little bit of our reserve balance, and we've been reducing our spending. But our expectation and our goal is to not spend any of our reserves. That's what you save for a rainy day. Now, I said that this is kind of like a hurricane, which probably means it's a rainy day, but let's see if we can get through it without spending our reserves and saving those funds for the future. But they're there, and we can use them in times of emergency. And I think that we've done a great job of avoiding that emergency so far. Well, and then there was the IT attack. Not our fault but definitely our job to fix it. And as of today, I believe we have almost every one of our systems back up and running and a plan and, and technology in place to prevent it from happening again. 2020, because of so many things happening in the world, in our country, not just the pandemic, but all the things that were occurring, created unrest. When I and many people saw the murder of George Floyd, we realized that the world had changed in a way that was scary and dangerous. We had to make changes. We had to do something about it. Even one small university has to do what they can do because the rest of the world has to do what they will do in their time frame. We moved forward very quickly with the George Floyd Scholarship for Social Change, and we established and awarded five of those scholarships to undergraduate students. We've enhanced and expanded the Clifford Clark Diversity Fellowship Program for our graduate students. We created a fellowship for racial justice in honor of Dominic Davey. We formed the Campus Citizen Review Board, chaired by Karen Jones and Myra Sabir, to look at our University Police Department's policies and practices. And we launched the Harriet Tubman Center under the direction of Sharon Bryant and Ann Bailey, a center that will look at freedom, reconciliation, and equity. And we also realized from results of a survey taken of our students that sexual assault, as it is on many university campuses, is unacceptably high. The results of that survey, as well as stories posted by students, made it clear that we had to do some things quickly. We have brought in an expert group of, of attorneys, Cush Blackwell, that will be looking at, have looked at, an independent review of our Title IX policies and procedures. We expect their report in the next few weeks. We are hiring investigators and counselors to increase our ability to support our survivors. And we are creating a survivor support center on campus to assist victims of sexual assault. When these things happen, action is important. Many times when these things happen, we make statements. Universities make statements. They're great at making statements. But actions were the call, the call this time. We knew we had to do things differently. And I think we have and we've put these things in place, and they will be here for a long time, most likely permanently. Let's look at some exciting things that happened in 2020-21. Well, ASHI, which is a group of scholars who look at the sustainability of higher education institutes, 
in their survey, in their review of our activity, has made us a top performer again, number one top performer in the area of research around sustainability. And that's based upon the number of our faculty whose research, publications, grants and contracts, programs that they, they deliver at the graduate level, are related to sustainability. And 25% of our faculty are in that category. Probably one of the most notable ones recently is John Zhang, associate professor in electrical and computer engineering, recently won a $2.6 million U.S. Department of Energy grant in order to make solar energy integrate more seamlessly into the electrical power grid. In another big story that got overshadowed by the pandemic, we have joined a consortium of 20 New York State public and private universities to create a large-scale renewable energy consortium. This consortium, this 20 university and college consortium, will be sourcing all of its electricity, meaning that we will have 100% of our electricity generated from new solar farms being built in upstate New York. And that for the next 15 years, we will have fossil fuel free electrical energy. And we're going to save money because it's going to be less costly than purchasing electricity generated by the combustion of fossil fuels. It'll also improve our reputation and our rankings for sustainability. And it's going to create, through the agreement, educational and research opportunities for our students and faculty to work at these solar farms. Even though during 2019-2020 we were dealing with a pandemic, we also knew that the TAEs were continuing to go forward. The TAEs, those six TAEs that we've created, have small seed grants that they have allocated to faculty in order to do different projects. About 17 projects were awarded in 1920. And going back to that previous slide where I talked about John Zhang, John Zhang actually started his idea from a TAE seed grant, about $10,000, to come up with the ideas that were needed in his proposal that won the $2.6 million Department of Energy grant. We also know, we are pretty sure, that the changes in the federal government are going to change how the federal government funds research and how they support higher education in a different way, perhaps more positive, but definitely in a different way. So under the guidance of Vice President of Research, Bhagat Samakia, we decided to form a task force that will review what changes might occur. What are the new leading ideas? and areas that the federal government will want us to work on in their partnership, those problems that they want us to solve. The task force has begun its work, and they'll have a report done at the end of spring 2021. We're continuing to grow. One of the best measures of growth are committed funds. These are proposals that have been awarded, but you actually haven't spent the money yet. In 2019-20, we received $60 million of commitments from external agencies. It's an increase of 23% from the prior year. Now, expenditures did dip during 2019-20, but that's mostly because of COVID-related restrictions. You couldn't travel, and we had a harder time bringing in new graduate students. So a drop of about 3.5% was expected, but lower than a lot of our other sister campuses. I love understanding and reading about some of the things that our faculty are doing in the humanities and social sciences. Melissa Camascioli, professor of history, her recent grant from the National Endowment of Humanities looking at trafficking, travel, and illicit migration in, in early 20th century France and the Americas. I also want to recognize Elizabeth Deganji, associate professor of anthropology, for working and critiquing some of the use of racial traits in forensic analysis. And Brian Kirshen, assistant professor in Romance Languages, who's creating an interactive website to help teach endangered languages, specifically the Judeo-Spanish language, Solitreo. Amazing stuff that our faculty are doing. We know that the humanities and social sciences are the core of Binghamton University, Harper College, and our legacy. Our alumni know that as well.
So a lot of things have happened in this last year. Let me just highlight a few of them. We have faculty who have been developing a disease-sensing mask. Pretty remarkable, right? Not standing in line, getting something stuck up your nose to, get, find out, to find out if you have COVID or not. A disease-sensing mask. Diagnostic sensors for COVID, wearable sensors that can detect if you have been in the presence of a COVID virus. Drugs that can suppress lung inflammation that's associated with COVID, one of the major causes of death from COVID. Tracking its impact on political movements in South America. And then some of the service activities that our students have done. If you wander past the diagnostic or the surveillance testing site in Old Union Hall, you will find it filled with pharmacy and nursing students working to provide those COVID tests. And the COVID pandemic is a tool for teaching. And our teachers in, who teach teachers in our College of, of Community and Public Affairs have been using this as an example to help teach secondary schools. CCPA internships have been providing mental health support for first responders. And I also want to thank faculty in industrial systems engineering who have modeled many of the things that we've done, many of the changes on campus that we've made in order to make sure that they work from moving, moving students in during the move-in period and the testing that we did at the event center to making sure that when students are walking across campus that they can still socially distance. We didn't stop working. We kept thinking hard. We kept applying our knowledge to the problems at hand. And again, I think a measure of success. So now you got to look ahead, right? That's, that's the, always the third part of a state of the university. What happened? What are our current challenges? Where are we? What's ahead? The roadmap is there. We started it in 2013. We've renewed it in 2018, but we decided now that it needs to be expanded even more. We've added faculty to, the, to many of this, these strategic priority committees. We now have 55 faculty and staff on the steering committee. We know that we've had to slow down some of the initiatives because of financial constraints, but we are continuing to invest in the most important projects. And in fact, over the past eight years, the university has invested more than $64 million in roadmap initiatives, not including the faculty that we've hired during that period of time. But we know that COVID, as well as federal policies, are going to change the way we work in higher education, particularly with respect to international education. So after eight years of the roadmap, with five strategic priorities, we decided we needed a sixth. And so we have formed a strategic priority number six on internationalization. It's going to be co-chaired by Don Neiman, our provost and vice president for academic affairs, and Madhu Govindaraju, the vice provost for international education and global affairs. This team and the people that will populate the strategic priority have a very important task ahead of them. As we know, a university must be international to be premier. And we have asked the foundation board, and they have allocated $1 million for us to move forward on ideas and plans of how we can expand the collaboration and the engagement that we have with international partners in research and in education, whether those international partners are in India or China or Turkey, Korea. We want to make sure that we reach, reach them, and without those investments from the foundation board, it would be very difficult. So we want to thank them for that support. It's probably been a tough year to say, let's be optimistic. But let's be optimistic. It's 2021. As I said, the hurricane is still above us, but we've learned how to manage it. We've battened down all the hatches. We know how to survive it, and we did make it through the 2020 semester. 2021 fall, uh, spring semester will be harder. Infection rates will be higher. But the vaccine will be here slowly and surely. And during the spring semester, the distribution of the vaccine will slowly creep across the country. And we will be, as predicted, a country that will be fully vaccinated 
most likely before the fall of 2021. That means that we have some planning to do to get ready for that transition. And that transition is going to be driven by our optimism. So let's be optimistic that all the things that we've done, we learn from. All the things that we've learned, we can either take or keep. Well, we keep having Zoom meetings. Well, people actually come to my office and meet with me anymore. Or will they just Zoom me? That's a good question. I'm going to find that out pretty soon, I think. One of the things that we found out, though, is that by offering programs remotely, the attendance can go up significantly. The alumni office, who typically runs, oh, 30, 40 programs a year to reach our alumni in different parts of the country where they have to actually physically come to the event, the attendance has skyrocketed at the remote events, the virtual events that they've put on. Instead of getting 30 or 40 people to an in-person event, they get 300 people to a virtual event. And I think that's been a great success for Binghamton University, to engage our alumni in a way that will help us in the future. So in conclusion, I think it was a successful 2020 because of all that you did. So thank you to all of you. More information can be found regarding the university's fiscal status at binghamton.edu slash finance and budgeting. And if you have any questions, you know you can always email me and I'll get right back to you at hstenger at binghamton.edu. Stay safe, Binghamton. See you soon.